emergency. All right, we're recording now. So welcome to the emergency citrus disease research and extension ECDRE information webinar. Next slide. Just some meeting logistics for everybody. This webinar is being recorded and your microphone should be on mute, but just in case it comes off mute, make sure it's muted for the duration of this presentation. And throughout the presentation, you may, you may chat with each other in the chat box, but we also have at the very bottom of the Zoom screen, you can see that there's by participants, there's Q&A. And if you go to the Q&A box, you could type questions in directly to us. We're not going to probably take live questions at the end, but we will answer your questions directly from that Q&A box, and we'll check the, check the chat box as well. And if you need to leave early, if you have another appointment, we understand this webinar is going to be posted on NIFA's YouTube page in about a week's time. So check back in about a week, because we do need to add captions to any webinar that we record at NIFA, but it will be publicly available at, at our YouTube page for your reference at a later time. Next slide. I just wanna remind all of our applicants, potential applicants and participants here that USDA is an equal opportunity provider, employer, and lender. In accordance with the federal civil rights laws, the USDA, USDA civil rights regulations and policies, USDA, its agencies, office employees, institutions participating in or administering any USDA programs are prohibited from discriminating based on race, color, national origin, religion, sex, gender identity, including gender exp expression, sexual orientation, disability, age, marital status, family or parental status, income derived from an assist, a public assistance program, political beliefs, or appraisal or retaliation for prior civil rights activities in any program or activity funded by the USDA. And we do, uh, for any, for any persons with disabilities that requires alternative means of communication, uh, we do have that available for you as well. And this, uh, this non-discrimination statement is available on our website. Next slide. And here you can see our ECDRE team uh, speaking right now. This is Erica Kistner thomas I'm a national program leader in the Division of Plant Protection. And my background is in entomology, particularly biological control and climate change. And I'm on this program because I did a postdoc at the University of California, Riverside, where I studied the biological control of the Asian citrus psyllid with the parasitoid Camarexia radiata. And then next to me, you'll see Dr. Emmanuel Biamukami, who just joined us from South Dakota State University. He is our new national program leader, and I'm happy to have him as my co-NPL co -NPL on this program. And he's a plant pathologist by training, and you'll hear from him later. And then to my Right, we have Logan Appenfeller. He's our program specialist and he is excellent at what he does and another entomologist by training. And we also receive a leadership from Dr. Rubella Goswami. She is our division director in plant pathology and she is a plant pathologist. So we have to have a kind of an inter interdisciplinary scientific team here because this is a very interdisciplinary and complicated uh, program and the problem is also complicated. And another group of people I want to give recognition to is, of course, the Citrus Disease Subcommittee. These are our industry representatives that provide feedback for us every year in terms of what research priorities are in the emergency citrus disease uh, request for pre-applications. Next slide. So the topics that we will be recover, uh, covering today in this webinar includes a program overview and history of the ECDRE program. We'll go over details in the request for pre-applications, including different grant types. We'll go over how our proposals are evaluated. It's a two review evaluation process. And then we'll conclude today with uh, some useful additional resources and information that you might, may find useful as you are penning your applications. Next slide. So I wanna go over the ECDRE program history because it's a little bit complicated. And I just want to let you guys know that we're different from the Specialty Crop Research Initiative. Now, prior to the 2014 Farm Bill, the Specialty Crop Research Initiative or SCRI did support citrus greening projects. And then in 2014, we split off from the Specialty Crop Research Initiative into the CDRE program or the Citrus Disease Research and Extension Program where we derive funding and authority from SCRI. We had a $22 million per year budget and we had mandatory 
funding from SCRI. And then in the 2018 Farm Bill, we renamed our program again to the Emergency Citrus Disease Research and Extension Program. And we now derive uh, funding from the Citrus Disease Trust Fund, but we continue derived authority from the SCRI. And again, we have a $22 million budget per year, but I wanna just make this clear that we're now a separate program from SCRI. You, we don't want uh, any citrus greening projects submitted to SCRI if you submit any citrus greening related or HLB related projects to the specialty crop research initiative, it'll get spit back to you and you will be told that you need to submit these to the ECDRE program. So just keep in mind that if you have any citrus greening or ACP crush, Asian citrus psyllid questions, you should come to the ECDRE, come to me or Emmanuel for questions about that because this is our flagship program for citrus greening disease. SCRI does not fund any of the, uh, any HLB work anymore. Next slide. Here's our executive summary for 2022. The Emergency Citrus Disease Research and Extension Program is soliciting proposals to develop effective tactics and strategies to control Huanglong Bing, i.e. citrus greening disease, and its disease complex for financially sustainable citrus growth in the United States. NIFA requests pre-applications for the ECDRE program to address priorities that are identified by the Citrus Disease Subcommittee of the National Agricultural Research Education, Extension, and Economics Advisory Board, or NERI Board, through projects that integrate research and extension activities and use system-based transdisciplinary approaches to provide solutions to U.S. citrus growers. So this is an interdisciplinary program that requires groups of researchers to work together to come up with innovative and novel solutions and shovelware-ready tools and technologies for citrus growers in the near term. Next slide. The overall goals and objectives of this program are to bring the nation's top scientists together with our citrus industry representatives to find scientifically sound solutions to the devastating citrus disease Guanglong Bing or citrus greening disease. And really this program wants our applicants to transition from narrow focused research to deploying research outcomes on the farm. And we encourage research teams to work together and bring their different interdisciplinary knowledge in a way that finds solutions to combat and and prevent HLB infection. So again, this, this program is really designed for folks that have done research in plant pathology and horticulture and have solutions that are gonna be ready for our growers in a relatively short term. Uh, we have other programs that can fund citrus screening disease, more foundational work, but for this program, we want folks to work together and come up with solutions in the near term. Next slide. The request for pre-applications website is listed here. And I just want to remind everybody that the pre-application deadline is coming up. It is exactly one month from today. So at 5 p.m. Eastern Standard Time on the dot, March 17th, 2022 is when it's due. And you need to submit this through grants.gov. And you can look up the funding opportunity number here. We have it listed as well as the program code. This program is a little bit different from other NIFA and NSF programs in that we invite all, we invite a variety of applicants. So federal agencies, national laboratories, colleges, private companies and organizations, state agricultural stations and cooperative extension services, individuals or groups that are consisting of two or more of these entities, they're all eligible to apply. But I do wanna remind applicants that if you are from you know, ARS or a university, we do um, encourage you to collaborate um, and partner up with private organizations or extension services to make your, applicant, your application more competitive. We really want uh, a lot of different perspectives working together to solve the problem of citrus greening disease. Next slide. For this year, there is no match required, and we estimate a total program funds of $22 million to go directly to the awardees. And the maximum award and duration will vary by the project type. So we have three different projects that you can um, apply for. We have what's known as a coordinated network project, which is set at $4 million max for a duration of five years. We also have a coordinated agricultural project or CAP, which is set at $15 million max, or five years. And we also have standard research projects, which are set at $1.5 million max for two years. And we will be talking about these in a little bit more detail later on in this presentation. Now we anticipate to uh, have about approximately four to five awards, including at least one coordinated 
Network Award that has been requested by the growers. So we are trying to make sure that at least one coordinated coordination network project is funded in 2022. Next slide. Now, this program has a two-phase review process, and it's a little complicated, so I'm going to step you through how it goes. So every year in about September, we meet with our industry representatives, at, and they provide advice and feedback for us on what their research priorities are. What tools and technology do, do they want developed? What is missing in terms of research development and products? And so they provide us that advice in a letter, and then we take that letter and then inter integrate that advice into our request for pre-applications. And then that's issued. Well, you guys have a little bit of time to write up your pre-applications, usually about 45 days. And once those are submitted, we review them through our first review process. So it's a two-phase review process, and we have one review panel that's done just by our citrus industry representatives. So they just review it. And, uh, and the, the citrus industry representatives include folks from California, Texas, and Florida. Once the, we invite applications based on the advice of the citrus industry panel, we'll, we'll invite folks to submit full applications. And once the full applications have gotten into us, and we then have our second re panel review, which is known as the scientific merit review. And this is an interdisciplinary a group of scientists, PhD experts in the fields of horticulture, plant pathology, entomology, extension, as well as economics. And we, once we have that second phase review, we integrate both the scientific merit and the industry review, for, um, uh, industry relevancy merit review into our final ranking and decisions for when we solicit awards. So awards are based off of both review processes. The list of awards are then presented to the Citrus Disease Subcommittee members in another meeting in the fall. And we have a project directors meeting with the new awardees meeting with the Citrus Disease Subcommittee where they, we slip feedback all over again. So this usually takes about one year. Next slide. So this is just a summarized timeline of the ECDRE program. Basically, we're at the pre-proposal uh, phase here. So that takes usually about a three-month process. So right now, we have our pre-applications or pre-proposals due one month from today at March 17, 2022. And it'll take us probably about another two months before you will hear back from us and we complete the industry relevancy review. Once we solicit folks to, um, to submit their full applications, That'll probably take about another two to three months until they hear back about award recommendations. So it, it, it takes a while. So full, rep, full proposals are then invited probably in, around the late spring. And then we have another two months where we do our scientific merit review. And then you'll probably hear back from us in late summer. So overall, this is gonna take probably eight months from when the request for pre-applications was released to when you hear back from us on your application status. So it does take a while, so be patient with us, but remember this is a two phase, two review phase process. What I can say for sure is we do have to uh, submit awards and get awards out to our awardees by the end of the federal fiscal year by September 30th. So you will likely be hearing back from us on the status of your application uh, if, you're, if you got invited to submit a full application uh, by uh, late September late summer and if and if you were just are waiting to hear back about your pre-application you should hear back from us in um you know springtime so maybe april or may so we'll we'll definitely be in touch with you next slide now the ecdre funding priorities for fy22 are a little bit different than in fy21 we got specific requests from the Citrus Disease Subcommittee that their number one priority is to fund at least one coordination network project, which is a project designed to facilitate greater sharing of Huang Long Bing or HLB citrus screening results nationally at the state level and internationally. Now, remember, folks, we have 15 years worth of Huang Long Bing and Asian psilocybin research. The, the disease has been around the United States for 15 years now, so there's a lot of research out there, and the growers really want more tools, more uh, summary of this data. So the goal of a, a coordinating network project would be to collect and summarize this data in some type of useful format for them. It's expected that a coordinating network project 
would work closely with us, NIFA, and the Citrus Disease Subcommittee to ensure that whatever format they decide to take the, the research results in would be to a way to help us inform decision making and increase the effectiveness of ECDRE programming moving forward. It would help identify gaps in our research as well as summarize what products and tools are already available. You'll hear more from Emmanuel about this a little later in our talk. But again, this is in the request for pre applications is that we do encourage applicants to consider uh, submitting a coordination network project because we expect to fund at least one of these projects in FY22. Next slide. We also, another high priority of the growers, but this is a secondary priority, is to continue to fund research and extension priorities. And these, the nine research priorities that I'm talking about here are, are, are basically reflective of our coordination or coordinated agricultural projects or our standard research projects. So you can do any one of these nine or combination of these nine research priorities if you are going to do a standard research project or a coordinated agricultural project application. So number one is a delivery system for therapeutics, nutrition, and other HLB solutions, especially those targeting the phloem. Number two, a better understanding of the HLB vector and citropathosystem, as well as the bacterium that causes citrus screening disease or CLAS. Number three, consolidation of screening efforts for intervention targets and reduction of candidate lists to include only those most worthy of advanced testing and commercialization. Number four, a cure for HLB infected trees or, and, and or strategies for maintaining their productivity. Number five, regional management or eradication of the Asian citrus psyllid on commercial citrus groves and residential plantings. Next slide. Number six, progress in the development of commercial citrus varieties, rootstocks and scions with genetic resistance to Huanglongbing using traditional breeding techniques and or gene editing. Number seven, a reliable technique for culturing the sea last bacteria. Number eight, optimized detection or surveillance programs for the Asian citrus psyllid and or HLB. And finally, number nine, greater understanding of the ecology and interactions of the citrus production system and the greeting system disease complex, Huang Long being and the Asian citrus psyllid. So understanding the disease um, post plant and vector complex. And you can, you can apply for any number of those different types of research priorities and you can combine them too. So now we're gonna go over the grant types. We have three different grant types, as I said before, and I'm gonna let Emmanuel talk to you guys about that. So Emmanuel. All right, thanks Erica. And thanks everybody for joining us. So as Erica mentioned, uh, we'll go through the different types of projects that will be supported by ECDRE for the financial year 2022. Next slide, please. So as Erica mentioned, uh, one of the project types that will be supported is the coordination network project. This project will be supported up to $4 million and up to five years max. The purpose of the coordination network project is to facilitate greater sharing of HLB research results nationally develop and support resources for data collection and management, develop tools for evaluation of progress, assessing the effect effectiveness of research and extension efforts, and helping identify priority research and extension needs going forward. The coordination network projects should uh, develop easy to use online resources or tools for past and ongoing USDA funded HLB research projects and outputs. And as Erica mentioned, uh, NIFA expects to fund at least one coordination project for the FOI22. So basically the coordination network project is to help NIFA and uh, uh, the Citrus Disease Subcommittee on how to increase the effectiveness of the ECDRE program. Uh, next slide, please. So the second type of project that will be supported this year is the Coordinated Agricultural Project or CAP for short. Uh, this is a much larger project uh, in scope and in scale. So it uh, has to be at the national level. Uh, the budget level support is up to $15 million. And this project can also go up to five years. The purpose of a CAP project 
is to address national scale efforts by coordinating, coordinating research and extension efforts in one of the goals identified by the citrus disease subcommittee. So those, those are the nine goals that uh, Erica just mentioned to us. So for the CAP applications, they should leverage existing citrus and HLB research investments. They should co coordinate efforts of multi-state and multi-institutional teams of biological, physical, economic, and social scientists. So build teams across disciplines uh, as you uh, plan these uh, pre-applications. So the CAP applications should also describe coherent and complementary integrated activities with the goal of developing a strategy or a solution preferably, preferably by the end of the project. A CAP application should also propose the formation of public-private consortia or other interdisciplinary groups to address one or more of the financial 2022 ECDRE research priorities as outlined in the RFPA. Uh, CAP applications should also support large-scale efforts for trials, demonstrations, coordinated testing across environments, as well as screening. We highly encourage applications that are collaborative with the cooperative extension and ongoing grower efforts. So this is really highly encouraged uh, to be shown in the pre-applications. So although we're not required at this level of pre-applications, but if uh, CAP applications are invited for full proposals, they will be required to include a business plan for deliverables, an advisory committee, and plans for documenting project impacts and communicating results to citrus producers and the public. So again, this is not required at the pre-application level, but just going forward, be aware that this will be required if full proposals are invited. Next slide, please. So the third and last project that will be supported by ECDRE this year is the standard project. So these are much smaller in scale. Uh, they go up to a million and a half dollars and they are only allowed for two years. And the purpose for the standard project is to support targeted problem solving efforts that are narrower in scope than a coordinated agricultural project or a coordination network project. So these projects are aimed at farm level implementation or commercialization of proven solutions or to examine uh, innovative ideas that will address one of the goals identified by the citrus disease subcommittee. Standard project applications should bring together research and extension components of the agricultural knowledge system around a program area or an activity. So these are, again, much smaller uh, projects in terms of funding and also the problems they can tackle uh, since they only last for two years. But again, these have to be integrating both research and extension. Next slide, please. So the other component we'd like to talk to you about is the stakeholder relevance statement. This is required irrespective of the project type. It should be a maximum of three pages and it should have the following contents. Number one, the title of the project, and this should be preceded by SP if the project is standard project, a CAP if the project is coordinated agricultural project, or CN if the project is coordination network project. Number two, it should have a budget. Uh, L. So this should be the estimated amount of funding that is being requested. And the details of the budget and the budget justification are not needed at the pre-application level. The statement should also show the significance and, and the benefit of the project, and that is economic, environmental, or social significance of the, of the problem being addressed. The statement should show the potential for, for der deliverables for the in citrus industry at the end of the project and specific milestones during the project. The statement should also show how information developed during the project will be translated into actionable recommendations or products 
and how this will be delivered to end users. Next slide. So the stakeholder state relevant statement should also show how the stakeholders will be engaged. And that is how stakeholders were engaged in defining the problem being addressed and determining project objectives and how stakeholders will continue to be engaged in the project development and its evaluation. Uh, the next uh, content item is the project outline, which should be one page maximum. And this, on this page, you should list the, the project objectives and an outline of the methodology to be used to, to achieve the, the goals uh, outlined. Uh, we would like to remind you here that uh, when you develop the, uh, when you list the objectives in the pre-application, these need to carry forward uh, into the full proposal if it is invited uh, for a full proposal, because there will be comparison of what was proposed at the pre-application level and into the full proposal, and that should also be reflected in the budget. Uh, the last statement in the stakeholder relevance statement is the experience of the project director and key uh, co-investigators, and we're requesting that at the pre-application level, the number of core investigators be limited to six, uh, but at the full proposal, uh, any number of uh, co-PIs can be included. So for the limited space for each of the uh, member on the, on the project team, uh, the, the, the experience can be limited to 100 words, but again, for the full proposal, this can be uh, further expanded on. So these are the uh, items that need to be in the stakeholder, uh, stakeholder relevance statement. Again, this is required for all the uh, project types, irrespective of the type. And this is what the industry panel reviewers will be looking at uh, in order to assess to invite the full proposal. Next slide, please. So here we'll provide the criteria that the industry review panel will be looking at uh, in order to decide whether uh, these pre-applications can be invited for full proposals. So they will be looking at whether the application addresses issues and challenges that are relevant on a national scale, whether the applications describe research and extension approach that will result into impacts and outcomes, which are important to the target stakeholders, uh, whether stakeholders are involved in identifying and developing project goals and objectives, and whether the stakeholders will be involved uh, during the project implementation. Uh, the applications will be judged whether the information developed by the project team will be delivered to stakeholders that will allow the stakeholders to implement new or improved solutions to HLB by the end of the project period. And lastly, they will judge whether the project team has members who have worked with the target stakeholders in the past and have the necessary experience with the described research and extension approach. So again, these are some of the criteria that the uh, industry panel reviewers will be looking at uh, when they are evaluating the pre-applications. Next slide, please. So here are some of the additional pointers kind of to help you as you develop pre-applications. So judging from su successful ECDRE pre-applications, uh, consider the following uh, uh, to be uh, very important as well. So uh, are the applications uh, targeting a grower audience? Uh, is the application easy to read and understand? Uh, are the applications not duplicative with the past HLB research? Uh, do they have clear and feasible project objectives, timelines, and deliverables? Uh, are they clearly showing the participation of stakeholders in the development of the project goals and objectives? And then finally, uh, whether the research results are useful and usable by the project's end. So again, these are some of the points that you should consider as you develop the plea applications. So next, uh, we'll hand over to Logan, who will take us through the application process and some of the resources that may be useful. Thanks, Emmanuel, and hello, everybody. Uh, at this time, I'm just going to walk you through a few important notes about the application process. So to begin with, you're going to want to confirm that your organization is registered with grants.gov 
and the system award management system. Now, most applicants tend to work for organizations that have already completed these steps. But considering that this that getting these credentials can take a few months, it's good to just make sure that it's been done prior to submitting your application. And then we encourage you to closely follow the application instructions and submission requirements in the RFPA, specifically part four, as well as the NIFA grants.gov application guide. And please note that to be considered for funding, all required forms must be submitted as part of a complete application package, and your application will not be considered if all required forms are not submitted together. And then to submit your application, you do that through grants.gov. And for additional resources to guide you through the process, you can access those uh, at the link listed at the bottom of the page, which is the NIFA grant training. And we've also got a few additional resources that you might find useful. If you'd like to find out about uh, more about NIFA webinars and events, you can uh, check out the NIFA events calendar. You can also sign up for the NIFA newsletter and funding opportunity alerts. And there's also a lot of interesting articles on the NIFA blog. And then we've also provided some links uh, regarding finding funding opportunities, keeping up with the upcoming RFA calendar and a competitive grants flowchart, which provides an overview of the competitive grants life cycle. And then finally, we've got a few resources to once again, help guide you through the application process and answer any questions that you might have. And lastly, we wanted to mention your opportunity to become a proposal peer reviewer yourself. So NIFA is always looking to recruit diverse panelists, which are selected based on their expertise, credentials, and NIFA panel needs. And for more information, you can contact the program staff listed in the request for applications for the program that you're interested in serving on. And to volunteer, you'll need to go to the NIFA peer review system website and click on the panelist recruitment link, and simply follow the prompts. Um, and we just want to note as well that you cannot be a reviewer for ECDRE in 2022 if you're listed as a co as a PD, a co-PD, or any type of key staff on a 2022 ECDRE application. And that will close us out. We can start taking questions at this time. So let's go ahead. Thank you, Logan and Emmanuel. So again, I'm gonna, before I get to the, the Q&A, uh, if you guys have any other questions, consult the request for pre-applications and you can be free, feel free to contact myself or Emmanuel if you have questions related to writing your application. And Logan can help you if you have some more issues of more technical stuff once you get closer to submitting stuff on grants.gov or you have questions about some of the forms you need to fill out. But let's, there's some good questions in chat that I'd like to address. There was one question about uh, duplicate or multiple submissions. Duplicate or multiple submissions with the same lead PD are not allowed. So you can be a co-PD on one application and a lead PD on another to EC Dairy in the same fiscal year. And this, and does that multiple submissions apply to other uh, NIFA solicitations? So. If you are a co-PD on a project for ECDRE and you take those same project objectives, copy paste at them and then submit the uh, relatively almost the same project to another NIFA project solicitation. Let's say you apply to the biological, the biotechnology risk assessment research grant BRAG program and they overlap in their award cycle, then that's a problem. So we really, we, you know, we, we, we encourage you to not submit the same project with the same team to multiple different programs at the same time. We want you to wait until one of your one of them's declined before you submit the exact same project. And so that's, but you can definitely be a co-PD on multiple ECDRE projects as long as you're only a, a, a lead PD on a single application within the same cycle. And then we have another good question from Neil McRoberts um, talking about uh, 
the Coordination Network projects. With over 15 years worth of research in the US alone, and with the wish for the regional coordination network projects to bring in international research, it seems unlikely that one regional coordination network will be able to cover all the relevant material. Some higher level coordination by NIFA to help divide the work between two or more projects that themselves are coordinated would seem to be an efficient way to achieve what's needed. Is there any scope within the request for pre-application to do something like this? So I understand that the, that the description of the coordination network is vague. And you're right, you're, a, a single coordination network project is not going to be able to cover all the, the research that has been done on Huang Wang being Asian citrus psyllid and all the different types of technologies for the last 15 plus years in one place. But you know, different groups of people could have different ideas of to how to create different tools. Somebody might want to do a decision support tool just focusing on citrus hybrids and rootstocks that have been developed through natural breeding techniques. Somebody want to might want to create a website just looking at consolidating all the different types of my new microbial peptides that are available. Somebody might want to just focus on California and do what types of best management practices are there for the Asian citrus psyllid, for example. So again, th there's for these regional coordination networks, there's not one answer. And I and in the chat, I'm going to put a link to some examples of NIFA regional coordination networks that we've funded in the past, and they solve different problems. So we understand that there's one regional coordination network is not going to be be able to summarize everything, but it would be great if we can get you know applications to be creative and think about what could they do to help consolidate some of what's been done already into easily usable format for growers to come to. They just wanna know what's out there in an easy to use format that's better than what's currently available with NIFA or the HLB MAC sites, which as you guys have been there, it's, it's kind of messy to find what has been funded and what products are available. So that's really what they want. And you're right, it's not gonna probably be done with one. That, you know, so we're, we're multiple ideas are great here for a coordination network project. Another uh, comment that we got here, a question was uh, the standard project overview stated that standard projects can focus on examination of innovative ideas that will address one of the identical, but earlier was stated this year's programs looking specifically for transition from component focused research to deploying proven research outcomes on the farms. So how compatible are these goals? So it is, yeah, I get what you're saying here. The standard research projects are more focused and narrower in scope than the coordinated agricultural projects or the, coordinate, the coordination network project. So you can still do more focused research. You can do you can do a microbial, trying to develop a microbial peptide, a novel delivery system to get that microbial peptide into the phloem of the tree. You can be more, you can definitely be more uh, targeted but the idea here is we want some, the, the growers are going to want to see some proof of concept. So if you if you have a high risk idea and you don't have any preliminary data at all to back up your idea, then they're probably not going to bite on it. So you're going to want to prove when you're selling what you have, your idea, you might want to have some preliminary data to back it up for sure. Even if your product might not be available in the next two to five years, they're going to want to see that it could if it works. You know, if all goes well, we fund you and you, it could be developed, you know, within the next five years and get to the regulatory process. So I hope that answers your guys' question there. Why aren't there any, oh, this is a good question from Neil McRoberts. Why aren't there any existing projects already doing that work, uh, getting into practice of existing funding? How would a, co a regional coordination network project avoid being outreach for, on the cheap for people who bring, who should be doing it already? Well, that's a good question. There isn't really any coordinated network project right now, as far as I know, in terms of citrus, in, in terms of combining and, and organizing all of the citrus greening research that has been done into an easy use format for growers. There's been some attempts of this at the state level in Florida for different um, grower commodity groups, but it would be great for somebody to do a coordination network and help us get what's been funded by NIFA and HLB MAC, so USDA funded projects into a, a more usable digestible format for growers. Um, and I suspect that this, uh, we've, we've solicited coordination network projects now for two years and we haven't gotten any bites. So uh, it just hasn't been something that applicants have wanted to do. Growers want this. They really would like some easy to use databases 
to see what's available, to see what the USDA has funded. And I realize you can't get everything out there because private companies have copyright protection, but it would really help to have some coordination network projects to work with us and help us build nice, usable, useful, pretty websites because we don't have the time to do that. So maybe to add to that, Eric, uh, um, as stated in the uh, request for pre-applications, uh, the coordination network would also help to analyze the entire program and see where the gaps for improvement. And so that's one thing that you know a, an individual project will not do. So the coordinated the coordination network would analyze what has been done and then so address some of the gaps where uh, efforts should be uh, put. Yeah, excellent point, Emmanuel. He hit it right on the head. So that's another reason that growers really want a coordination network project is because they there's there might be gaps that we are not addressing and they can't see them because we don't have all of this information of USDA funded citrus greening, Asian citrus psyllid, citrus hybrid, all the stuff we've done over the years, it's very hard for them to see it. So I hope that answers everybody's questions. Are there any in the chat that we're missing, Logan? Nope. Yeah. And again, we're still funding uh, standard research projects and we're st still funding a coordinated agricultural project so that that's that big scale multi-state uh, projects too. So we're still funding those projects as well. So don't feel like you have to apply for a coordination network project. We're still funding the other ones. And I guess, yeah, if nobody has any other questions, I uh, let, let us know, follow up with us later and we can, oh, are there any, how many caps will be funded this round? That's, I, I do not know. Uh, that depends on the quality of the applications we get. Uh, last year, we only funded one cap. So this year, we might fund one cap and we might not fund any. It really depends on the quality of the applications we get. Because remember, they have to go through a two-phase review process. So the growers have to say, we want this cap project to go on and we, we want this to potentially be funded. If they, if they don't like any of the cap applications they get, then they we won't fund any this year for sure. But yeah, it's, I, think it's, I think one would be the max we could fund probably if we do fund a cap, but there's no guarantee of that. Um, Neil McRoberts, we'll follow up with you later on the, the Regional Coordination Network if you have more questions. We can set up a separate time to talk. Um, any other questions that folks have? Well, it looks like I don't, I'm not seeing any new questions in the chat. So I, I guess we'll give everybody back uh, another 15 minutes of their day. And remember, this will be posted on YouTube in about a week's time. And we thank you all very much for your time. And I'm really excited and looking forward to your applications. Uh, feel free to email myself, Manuel or Logan, if you have any follow-up questions. I really am excited to be getting your applications and hope uh, it'll be a smoother process. So thanks everybody for your time. I look forward to speaking with you and working with you for this process.